Yes, we are, we are seeing the screen and we are waiting for your own camera if there is possibility to open it. Can, can you see my screen, my PowerPoint? Your screen, yes, it's good. And we are waiting for your video to see you that to, to open your your webcam, your, your camera to our. If there is no problem, you are welcome. You can start, sir. You can start, sir. Are you hearing us, Professor? Okay, yeah, can't do both. Um, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, pleasure to take part. Excuse me, I didn't hear well. Can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you, sir. You can't start. Is what um, this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about. Okay, so uh, I'm hearing your voice interrupt. Is, is there a problem? A problem for our connection. You can start, sir. Okay. Uh, shall I proceed or not? Could you please, Maxima, and we need the, the, uh, the full screen, please. Could you share with us that the full screen? Because it's too small. We are seeing that. Okay, yes. is that okay? Good. You can start, sir. Shall I start? Sh shall I start? Yes, you can. Yes, you can, sir. Okay. The topic of my talk is what are institutions? So I will talk briefly about the definition of institutions and I will raise some problems or, or discussions that various authors have had about the meaning and definition of institutions. So I, I'll discuss at some length Douglas North's a position, or in at least how Douglas North's position has been interpreted. So basically my aim is to clarify the meaning of a key term, which is an institution. Uh, definitions and the use of words are very important. Here's a quote from Confucius, the famous Chinese philosopher. You can read that while I'm talking. Words are important in social science because they carry meaning. And because science is a social process involving conversation, then it's important that we communicate meaning. When we do not adequately communicate, communicate meaning, then it's very difficult to hold a fruitful conversation and move our analysis forward. Economists are very fond of justifying mathematics in terms of the precision it often brings to a problem. So they talk about models and the need for modeling as a way of investing analysis or theory with necessary pre precision. But we also use words and words are unavoidable and there's far too little attention to conceptual precision. So we need analytical precision generally and in particular, 
as well as mathematics, we need conceptual precision. So it's in that spirit that I'm going to try and pin down some workable meaning for the term institution. There's rival conceptions of what institutions are. Uh, one example is equilibria, particularly equilibria in game theory, in game theory arguments about institutions, institutional change and institutional equilibria. A leading exponent of this position in many important works is Kenneth Binmore. So he argues explicitly that institutions are equilibria in games. Another rival view, which is actually more widely spread, albeit in slightly different forms, is that institutions are systems of rules. Douglas North said something like that, Lynn Ostrom as well, John Searle, the philosopher. They all, in slightly different ways, argued that institutions are systems of rules. I'm going to argue for that position, the second position. There's a third position which has come up more recently, which is by the philosopher, philosophers Frank Hendricks and Francesco Guala. They, they've argued that it's both. I'm going to argue that in terms of a definition, well, um, maybe elements of equilibria in institutional situations, it's not necessary to, to have the equilibrium concept alongside it. So to very briefly go through these three alternatives, the idea that institutions are equilibria is particularly useful in terms of game theory, of understanding how rules emerge through interactions in agents in a game theoretic setup. But it's less flexible when it comes to real-world situations. For example, if language is an institution, for example, the meaning of words in, la in language gradually change through time. Uh, laws, which are rules, um, also remain static. You could call them equilibria, but they too get adapted through time. They get applied to novel situations and they change. So the fixed notion of equilibria, which we have in game theory, is really too inflexible to take on board the possibility that rules and their interpretations may change through time or equilibrium situations may change through time. So I think that's a bit restri restrictive. And as I said before, the systems of rules argument is, I think, stronger because it allows for that possible flexibility. Or do we need to follow Hendricks and Guala and argue for both? I think this is unnecessary. I think there's an insight in their argument. They make the important argument that defining institutions in terms of systems of rules requires some understanding of why rules are followed. Yes, that's true. We do need an understanding of why rules are followed and how rules get set down, how they emerge, why they become on and through time and so on. That's an important point. But in response to Hendricks and Goala, is that necessary for a definition of institutions? And I want to say a bit more about this argument, about distinguishing between defining institutions or describing how they work, what they are and what they do. These are not the two, two, two uh, identical things. Definition is not the same as description or analysis. And we have to understand what the role of a definition is and distinguish that from description or analysis. To give a quick example, Here's the standard definition of a mammal. Mammals are defined as a clade, clad of animal where the females suckle their young. Now that gives you a definition, which a rough and ready definition, which serves to demarcate mammals from other 
animals, other kinds of animal. So on the right hand side, we have three mammals. We have a duck billed platypus at the top, which is a rather odd mammal because unlike most mammals, it actually lays eggs, but it still suckles its young. And we have elephants, which of course are huge, and we have mice, which of course are very small. So the definition, there's a number of things to observe about this simple definition of a mammal. First of all, it covers a wide range of things. It covers things as different as mice and elephants, which are a different, very different size. So there's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing wrong with having a definition which covers a lot of things. Some people object to the rules-based definition of institutions because it covers a lot of things. Well, on that basis, you should object to the, this definition of a mammal. The second point to observe is that a lot of things are missed out. Um, those three kinds of animal on the right-hand side have a lot of things in common. They have respiratory systems. They have a skeletal frame. They have four limbs. They have uh, skin. They have a heart. They have lungs. They have a brain, a nervous system. They have eyes. Lots and lots of things are common to all mammals, but they're not in the definition of a mammal. So the definition of a mammal is not about understanding what a mammal is or how it works or describing what a mammal is in detail, definitions for our purposes are fundamentally taxonomic or demarcatory. They demarcate one set of phenomena from another set of phenomena. So what we need, or all we need, when we're looking at institutions, are a set of criteria which demarcate institutions from other things in the social world or other things elsewhere. It's a demarcation job that a definition has to do rather than a description or analytical job. So that is why I object to the Hendrix Guala argument because I don't think we need to add equilibrium to the definition, even though equilibrium may be important. Of course, with mammals, the limbs and the brain are also important, but we don't include it in the definition. So the possible definition, brief version of it, is institutions are systems of established and prevalent social rules that structure social interactions. There's a few words there added, which are a bit vague because prevalent structure, all, all these things need to be pinned down. But I'm, what, what's trying to be signaled there is that the rules are not just arbitrary or not just simply declarative. When there are laws and rules, even in developed countries, which are not observed, uh, they are on the statutes that people ignore them. Apparently, there's a law in France that women should not wear trousers. Now, that's ignored quite rightly in France. Um, there's caste discrimination is illegal in India, but unfortunately caste discrimination still persists. So things which are simply declared or written in the statutes which have no social impact are excluded by this definition. There must be some significant social impact on these rules. And we also need to think about the term rule itself as well. I'll come to that in a minute. So this is a rough working definition of what institutions are. I'll introduce a different word. There's a confusion because there's a, um, a school of thought in France called the École de, de Convention, the Convention School. And they use the word convention in a particular way, which is very close to the meaning of institution here. But in, at least in English language, the Anglophone literature, we need to uh, distinguish terms. And I'm suggesting the word convention could be used following Sugden and Searle as a particular instance. So, for, with, for example, uh, an, an important set of rules are traffic rules, rules that govern how you should drive 
in uh, along roads in particular countries. And as you know, in Britain, the rule is drive on the left. Uh, in France or Turkey, it's drive on the right. So we could say that uh, traffic systems are institutions, but there are different conventions. The convention in Britain is to drive on the left and in many other countries to drive on the right. So that's a use of a convention, the term convention to signal a particular usage. That's a possible meaning, which follows two leading uh, philosophers in the area. What do institutions do? They constrain. So driving on the left means you can't drive on the right and vice versa. Prescribe, they tell you what you must do. You must fill in your tax return and, and submit it and so on. And they enable. Um, a lot of rules enable behavior as well as constraining it. I'm talking to you in English and I'm more or less following the rules of the English language and that enables me to communicate. So following rules is not necessarily a restrictive thing. It could also be a enabling thing. What do institutions do? They create stable expectations of the behavior of others. Again, to use the uh, driving example, when you're driving down a road and the convention is to drive on the right, you expect others will be doing the same thing. If they don't, which they occasionally fail to do, they then it's obviously very dangerous and accidents can, can occur. So the fact that we're told to drive on the right in a particular country means that we expect others to do the same. What's the difference between institutions and other things? Now, in social theory, the word structure is used a lot. People talk and write about social structures. Now, all institutions are structures, but not all structures are institutions. So what are examples of that? Uh, social structures are not institutions if they are not in uh, defined or uh, expressed in terms of rules. So we have things like a demographic structure in a country, which is not necessarily encoded in rules. There's been demographic, demographic structures in every single society since humanity, the dawn of humanity, um, and people may have not even reflected upon it, but they existed because there was an age structure in every society. There's many other examples of structures which are not encoded in rules and therefore are not institutions. So there's a difference between the even broader term structure and the more particular term institution. So let's turn now to the question of rule. Um, here again, there's a sort of sketch definition. The term rule can be broadly understood as a socially transmitted normative injunction or imminently normative disposition, a little bit complicated, I'll explain in a minute, that in circumstances X do Y. So there's a conditional trigger when circumstances X occur, you must do Y. That's the normative bit, the no must be. It's either normative because people tell you, or you think it's important that you do it, or you have a disposition to do it. So that's the reason for those words in the middle of that definition. What do we mean by socially transmitted? Well, that's important to distinguish rules from things like instincts. If there's a, a flash of light or a loud noise, as human beings, we will react to that. A flash of light will normally, without any thinking, blink our eyes. We will turn our head with a loud noise, wondering what's happening. So we react instinctively without any thought. It's not a rule. It's a regularity that in circumstances X do Y, but it's not socially transmitted, it's instinctive. So we're talking about things like habits and routines which are socially transmitted. These are the, the, base, the, the normal circumstances in which rules are, um, uh, are passed on. So hopefully that, that is a bit clearer. Um, so rules include norms of behavior 
and social conventions, as well as legal or formal rules. So legal rules are important, particularly in societies, modern societies, and ever since we've had legal systems, which is for thousands of years, previously we had customary rules, which are, which are different. I use the word formal, and there's a warning here because there's an ambiguity with the word formal, and we need to think about that. I mean, I may repeat this point later, but the, the basic argument I'm going to make about the formal informal distinction is that if you use it, define it, because people use it in different ways. Don't take it for granted that everyone understands one meaning of formal, but one meaning of formal is legal. Many people use it that way. If you want to use it that way, you need to make that explicit. Rules can be constitutive or procedural. Um, if you have a, 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 a piece of money, a note or a coin, um, th that is, uh, is subject to constitutive rules. In other words, as a social recognition of something with a particular quality, with a particular stamp or design or a coin of some kind, serves as money in circumstances where money can be used for buying and so on. So it's the same con conditional construction, in a, but in a constitutive sense. In circumstances X or with qualities X, Y occurs. Procedural rules are when you are doing something and X occurs, you must do Y. Rules are normative. That means by their nature, they're injunctions to do something, and they're potentially codifiable. They're not necessarily codifiable, uh, um, and they're not even necessarily written down. But because they have a normative and socially transmitted character, they can be written down as written rules, if writing exists, of course. The criterion of codifiability means that breaches of the rule can be identified explicitly. When we were in tribal societies, uh, things were handed down by custom, rules were handed down by custom, and this was done typically by word of mouth or by imitation and so on. In larger scale societies, we use writing and we have legal systems and we can write down rules. Um, we call them laws, and when people break those rules, we can point to the law and say, you've broken the law, and there may be some punishment and so on. So code of viability has that facility to actually identify breaches of rules. Socially transmitted means the replication of rules develops, depends on a developed social culture and some use of language. According to John Searle and others, language, language itself is an institution. Um, and that's, I think that's fair enough because it's a system of rules. Not everyone takes that view, but that's a prominent view among Searle and others. But every other institution depends on language. So if language is an institution, it's in a sense a supreme institution because through language, we express the rules which are relevant for every other single institution. Um, what's the relationship between the outside world that we confront and the rules we see being observed and our understanding of it? Well, that it's a complex relationship, as Searle and others have examined at some, in some depth, between the mental representation of a rule and what happens in the real world. It's a kind of two-way feedback where because rules are followed widely or a particular rule is followed widely, that creates a social reality or a social fact where that institution is constituted by the widespread following of that rule. So there's a complex interaction between what's in our heads in terms of understanding of rules and how these rules relate to the broader community. 
Um, also important that we follow rules without, not necessarily with any subjective formulation in thought of the rule. Uh, an example here is uh, the rules of language. I'm more or less following the rules of the English language while I'm talking to you, but I don't understand or could not express uh, uh, all the rules of that language. If I was an English language expert, I may be able to do so, but I'm just a native English speaker. And um, if I'm trying to explain to one of my non-English PhD students when you should and should not use a definite article in English, I have some difficulty in explaining this because it's not something I think about. But I follow that rule more, more or less when I speak English. So I f I'm following rules without understanding these rules. And this is um, a, a, an interesting set of cases. Uh, and we do, we're doing this because of imitation. We're learning by imitation and we're acquiring tacit meaning without necessarily acquiring the full meaning. So a lot of rule, rule transmission between people has this peculiar quality that we cannot, we follow the rule, but we can't necessarily express the rule. Okay, the next uh, question is how institutions work. So the point of having a definition of institutions is that you can get multiple points of view amongst social scientists coming in to, uh, to try and work out how they work. Now, the precondition of that is some common understanding of what you're talking about. As I said earlier, social science is a social process. Therefore, it's necessary to have some common understanding so that we can communicate with each other. So here we have some divergence of understanding of how institutions work uh, in different schools of thought. I'll go through this very briefly. Um, there's a, the original or early institutionalism, old institutionalism, uh, was led by people like Veblen and Commons and others, and they took a pragmatist approach and they um, e emphasized shared habits of thought and behavior. Habit here is to propensity to behave in a particular way in particular cast of situations. This contrasts with the rational choice approach to institutions which others have put forward. Um, so there's contrasting views and uh, contrasting approaches of how you analyze how institutions work. Um, one point of view would also stress that institutions are not simply perpetuated through convenient coordination rules, the alpha, which actually is a critique of uh, some of Ben Moore's work. Um, there could be downward effects where institutions affect us. That would uh, concur with arguments by Veblen and Commons and others. Now let's turn to, Doug, to Douglas North. And we introduce here the term organization. So ob the obvious question is, what's the difference between organizations and institutions? I propose here a definition of organizations. That organizations have criteria to establish their boundaries. They have membership, uh, members and non-members. They have principles of sovereignty concerning who is in charge. They have chains of command and social positions. So the question is, having roughly defined organizations, are organizations institutions? And also, what does Douglas North say about this? North is interpreted as saying or distinguishing between institutions and organizations and between formal and informal institutions. Many people misinterpret North as suggesting that organizations are not a type of institution. In other words, a, misin a claimed interpretation, or I would say misinterpretation of North, is the view that we have to separate completely organizations from institutions. 
And if you have organizations, they are not institutions. He does not, in fact, say that. He also misinterpreted to making a distinction between formal and informal institutions. <coughs> he is a bit misleading, though. Look at something he, he wrote. This is in his book, 1990. Institutions are the rules of the game in society. Conceptually, what must be clearly differentiated are the rules from the players. The purpose of the rules is to define the way the game is played. And so on. Does this say, well, first of all, is this a definition of institutions? He doesn't say that it is a definition. It's a description of what institutions or some institutions do. To say the rules of the game must be differentiated from the rules of the players is not a statement that we must differentiate organizations from institutions. So there's no clear evidence here that North is defining institutions in this passage or making the distinctions which people attribute to him. This is another statement, shorter, to the same point. If institutions are the rules of the game, organizations and their entrepreneurs are the players. This doesn't say that organizations are not institutions. Right, the, the, to understand North, and I, I knew him personally, and I corresponded with him on this, he explained that he had a primary interest in economic systems. It was a macro level view, rather than the internal fun functioning of individual organizations. There's nothing wrong with the idea that under some conditions, organizations can be treated as single actors. If you're looking at the macro side, the system level view of, of, uh, of a society, then you can treat organizations as single actors, under certain conditions at least. The problem arises is if we define organizations as actors. In other words, if we say organizations are simply actors, North doesn't do that. But he does not make clear whether he's defining organizations as players or regarding organizations as players as an analytical abstraction. But he's now acknowledged, or he acknowledged to me before he died, that it is possible for organizations to be treated as actors in some circumstances and generally to be regarded as institutions. So I asked North in 2002, would you accept a definition of organization that accepted that organizations themselves had internal players and systems and rules, and hence organizations were a special type of institution? North responded in a letter to me and said, this is exactly what I have in mind, so we are in complete agreement. So North himself did not say that organizations are not institutions. I've published this correspondence, it's in my 2006 article, with the same title of this lecture. So North accepts that organizations are institutions. There's this problem also with North's distinctions between formal rules and informal constraints. These are, these are a bit confusing, and he didn't really clarify these, these points adequately. For our purposes, Note that some writers identify the formal with the legal and see informal rules as non-legal, even if they may be written down. Other authors make distinction of what explicit versus tacit rules. You need to choose. There's no consensus over this, but you need to choose and you need to be clear what meaning you're adopting. North examples of formal constraints are rules, constitutions, and informal constraints are norms, behavior, conventions, self-imposed codes of contact. This suggests that rules are a special kind of formal constraint, but it's not clear. If all rules are formal and institutions are essentially rules, then all institutions are formal. So it may be a bit misleading. So North is, tends to identify both rules and institutions with formal, i.e. legal re regulations. I would say that this is a bit too restrictive. It's actually, incidentally, similar to uh, John R. Commons, who um, 
can be criticized for excluding from the category of an institution social orders that are not legally expressed. Commons like North had a relatively narrow definition of institution or implied definition of institution. I would suggest this is a bit too narrow. So to conclude and wrap up by summarizing these definitions, social structures include all sets of social relations, including episodic and other arrangements, as well as social institutions. Institutions are systems of established and embedded social rules that structure social interactions. Rules are socially transmitted and customary normative injunctions or imminently normative positions that in circumstances X do Y. Conventions are particular instances of institutional rules and habits are dispositions to engage and previously adopted or acquired behavior triggered by an appropriate stimulus or context. Hence, they have the same structure in circumstances X do Y. And putting these forward as definitions which may be helpful to um, obtain some minimal agreement about what we're talking about in terms of institutions and related terms so that we can further advance institutional analysis in this way. Uh, organizations are special institutions. I've put those three criteria down already, so I won't dwell on those anymore. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer some questions. Well, thank you, sir, for the good presentation that you shared with us. And uh, right now, uh, we are waiting for some questions, but I don't think that there is a question. Uh, well, we are waiting for the channel if there is some question or not. And uh, really, we would like to thank you all. It was really beneficial ideas that you shared with us, sir. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Like uh, in our channel, also as there is no so no questions, so we would like to thank you once again, and uh, we are going to finish the speech with you, sir. I hear as a speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Yes? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I would like just to, to say to our listeners uh, that uh, the people who are watching us in our channel, uh, our up coming uh, presentation will be after 20 minutes. So see you after 20 minutes. Thank you, sir. And goodbye, sir. <laughs>